Welcome to Guantanamo Bay. Now, of course, you can see that it's a tropical paradise, but that's not why we're here. Over that hill, about two kilometers, there are 275 Muslim men the Pentagon believes are terrorists. But today, the U.S. military has agreed to give my cameraman, Osama Farag, and myself, and several journalists, a tour of the world's most famous prison. The media's movement is tightly controlled. CBC cameraman Osama Farag must clear every shot with a minder. Can you shoot here? This part? Yeah. Some kind of. Do uh, yeah, uh, better not. We're allowed to film prisoners from the neck down only. No faces. Reporters are instructed not to ask the prisoners questions. To break the rules, we could find ourselves on a quick flight home. Our guide at Camp 5 also requests that we don't show her face. The narrow windows on the cell doors have cardboard taped over them. Nonetheless, the prisoners immediately know we're here. We gotta go. Colonel Bush hustles us out. But our Camp 5 tour guide restarts the tour. She shows us an interrogation room. Only, she doesn't call it an interrogation room. In the vocabulary of the new Guantanamo, it's a reservation room. Why is it called a reservation instead of interrogation? We call all their appointments reservations. There's no reason. It's just we don't tell the guards exactly what they're doing. We say this detainee has a reservation. Osama spots a soldier counting out sheets of toilet paper. A privilege a prisoner loses when he's sent to Camp 5 is his roll of toilet paper. Here, it's doled out 30 sheets at a time. We are about detaining you, removing you from the battlefield, and then keeping you off the battlefield in a safe and humane way as we possibly can. The Pentagon says 100 of the prisoners are considered, quote, too dangerous to be released, but cannot be tried for lack of evidence. 60 have already been cleared for release, but cannot be sent home because their own countries would likely harm them. We turn to a group of prisoners that not only been cleared for release, but also have been reclassified as civilians. These 17 prisoners are no longer considered enemy combatants, but are entering their seventh year in captivity at Guantanamo. They're the Uyghurs, a Muslim ethnic minority group from Western China. Cash bounties offered by U.S. forces encouraged local villagers to turn in as many people as they could capture. And this is what Abu Bakr and two dozen other Uyghurs say happened to them. Five weeks after 9-11, Boumedia was arrested by Bosnian police and charged with conspiring to blow up the U.S. and British embassies. The Bosnia courts were about to free Boumedia when in January 2002, the U.S. military shackled him and flew him to Guantanamo Bay. He thought the U.S. would clear him. Maybe one week, two weeks. They know I am innocent, I, I come back to, 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 to my home. But in Guantanamo, Boumedia says he was kept awake for 16 days straight and repeatedly physically abused. After what he describes as a seven and a half year long nightmare, Lakdar Boumedia is now a free man. We, we were surrounded and then chained and with the family. I was in Pakistan with my wife and a child, a baby child of six months years old. So we were chained and then head covered and then sent to Bagram base. We were tortured in Bagram and then from Bagram to Guantanamo. And many people have we heard that died. Uh, and uh, people lost their hands, lost their eyes, lost their, their, their limbs. Everybody was sexually abused and uh, the guards couldn't do anything they wanted. I was uh, one of those who t survived those kind of torture. Uh, on my set they used uh, electroshocks because I will not sign papers. Uh, I should uh, I was forced to agree that I'm be a member of Taliban and Al-Qaeda, and I said uh, I'm not. In the year 2000, Aljanko was tortured by Al-Qaeda, who accused him of being a Western spy, and he was imprisoned by the Taliban for 18 months. He was then captured by the United States in 2002 and spent the next seven years in Guantanamo. The Al Jazeera cameraman Sami al Hajj has been released from Guantanamo Bay. He was detained in Guantanamo for nearly six and a half years without a trial or any charges brought against him. Conditions in Guantanamo are very, very bad, 
and they get worse by the day. Samuel Hajj had been tortured while at Guantanamo and subjected to 200 interrogation sessions. He's lost 40 pounds, is suffering from intestinal problems and bouts of paranoia. Samuel Hajj's younger brother told Al Jazeera he doesn't recognize his 39-year-old brother because he now looks like a man in his 80s. Ahaj said he worried for the prisoners that are left behind at Guantanamo. We, in a public platform, testified about our experiences in Guan, uh, you know, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Guantanamo Bay. I highly doubted that any of them were guilty of anything. I knew that for sure there was a there was a huge population of people there that, w that weren't guilty of anything. You know, you got a lot of these detainees that were that were innocent, has been proven innocent, and they're trying to tell their stories, and people don't believe them. This is really international lawlessness. At Guantanamo, by the U.S. own admission, 95% of the people there, overwhelmingly, they were tortured. 95% of them had nothing to do with Al-Qaeda. But if you want a practical reason not to torture, I can tell you that 90% of the people that I dealt with, at least 90% of the people that I dealt with, were completely innocent of, of anything. We didn't even have like a good reason to suspect that they that they had, had done anything or had information. We can't continue to detain people uh, and with, without giving them trials. If we're going to be acting completely illegally and not be providing legal, you know, like a legal structure for these people, then we're, we're just showing the whole world that we're liars. Authorities at Guantanamo said that three men had killed themselves. New evidence has emerged suggesting the men died not from suicide, but torture. A six-month investigation by Harper's Magazine indicates the three prisoners were suffocated and tortured during questioning at a secret black site facility at Guantanamo. Explain the story. What happened? How did you find out these were not suicides? We began looking at autopsy evidence, all sorts of other evidence, which strongly suggested that there was something uh, seriously inappropriate here. Uh, we talked with pathologists and so on who told us they'd rarely seen something quite as irregular as what was going on here. Uh, the guards are assembled and they're told uh, that the story that will run is that they committed suicide by hanging themselves in their cells and you may not contradict or undermine that in any way you should not talk about what you saw or observed and they reminded them that their telephones and their email communications were being monitored It seems that what happened in reaction to those photographs at Abu Ghraib uh, was that some low-level underlings pretty much took it in the teeth, uh, and then the usual story of, uh, well, you have a few bad apples gets circulated. But if you look a little bit behind, you know, or a little bit further than that, you find out that that kind of behavior appears to have been uh, widespread. People should realize that it wasn't the apples at the bottom of the barrel. It was the apples at the very top of the barrel that fouled the whole barrel. When we talk about torture, uh, we're talking about something that is so, so, um, so much apart from what I believe to be what America stands for. First off, what McCain always says, gives our country a bad name. 
if you're trying to shut down an insurgency, uh, it's the wrong thing to do because we, you're actually fueling the insurgency, you're fueling uh, the anger of the Iraqi people because everybody there, they were either uh, in custody themselves or they knew somebody, they had family members. This creates a lot of anger against us. When I was in Iraq, you know, I oversaw the interrogations of foreign fighters. Uh, and those foreign fighters, the majority of them said time and time again, the reason they had come to Iraq to fight was because of the torture and abuse of detainees at both Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo Bay. And this is not my opinion. The Department of Defense tracked these statistics, uh, and they were briefed to every interrogator who arrived there that, the, that uh, torture and abuse was Al-Qaeda's number one recruiting tool. Well, is that right? Yeah. Is it important? Yeah. Is it the most important? I don't think so. Second one up. Um, it endangers our own men and women. Is that important? Sure it is. And, you know, when we talk about endangering, I'm not only talking about physical endangerment. I'm talking about the trauma that comes when our troops are asked to brutalize others. The idea of torture is, I, I think, it has gotten kind of crazy. I, I, just being there is torture. I was being told by my leaders that they that these people were not enemy prisoners of war, and therefore, you know, the, we could really sort of do whatever we wanted. So I was using, you know, dogs, I was using hypothermia, I was using uh, sleep deprivation, isolation, uh, dietary manipulation. We would keep the prisoner outside, uh, and they would have like a polyester jumpsuit on, and they would be wet and cold and freezing. I was working with a marine unit, and they would go out and do a raid and stay in the detainees' homes and torture them there. And they were far worse than anything I ever saw in a prison. Uh, they were breaking bones. They were smashing people's feet with the back of an axe head. Uh, they burned people. It's just not something you just shut off overnight. It's, it's just something that you relive every day of your life. It's nothing you'll forget. And uh, for me, over time, it's just, it's just really built up. And every day I, I think about it and I relive those situations, and it, and, it, and it gets the best of me. And that kind of process brutalizes the brutalizer. So that's the kind of uh, equally uh, noxious effect of, uh, of having troops torture people. The big thing is, of course, that any, any experienced intelligence professional knows that torture doesn't work. You apply enough pressure to a subject and they'll tell you anything you want. Now, don't take my word for that. Take the word of the head of Army Intelligence. Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson was Colin Powell's hey, uh, chief of staff when he was the Secretary of State under George W. Bush. George Tennant told Dick Cheney what Dick Cheney wanted to hear. Oh yes, it's working, Mr. Vice President. We're getting great information and we're stopping terrorist attacks. That is utter bull. What we're seeing is that waterboarding and enhanced interrogation techniques, just like professional interrogators have been saying for years, uh, always result in, in either limited information, false information, uh, or no information. Torture then, because it breeds false information, then leads to um, more people being caught up. Um, and you know, and you can see how torture is then applied to them, and the whole thing spirals out of control. The problem with Guantanamo is that it is based on uh, an incoherent mosaic of evidence that is untrustworthy, that has primarily been obtained through the dubious interrogations of other prisoners. History has shown that no good information comes from applying torture techniques. We have learned that very painfully, especially out of the empirical evidence of the last few years. Where are, where are the moral voices in our country? If some people in Nazi Germany spoke out and said, no, this is wrong, I'm not going to do it, you know, early enough, things could have changed. What's happening today in our country? Presidential candidates are vying with each other to show how tough they are. One says uh, double the size of Guantanamo, and others say, yeah, torture is a great thing. Where are they? Mainstream churches. Where are the where are the folks that claim to have some moral authority? Silent. Deafening silence. Is it ever worthwhile in your view? Well, I, I think morally no. I, I think that morally we should re reject torture entirely. And I think that should be a moral standard that we should hold. I don't think that we need to compare ourselves to Saddam Hussein.